Good morning, everybody, and welcome back. Before we begin a new unit focused on democratization, we're going to finish up the last, last, last part of our lecture on institution building. Remember that institution building was the first unit in our larger section on the different aspects of political development and how different institutions and policies and arrangements emerge or don't in a given country. And we talked about the strength of different institutions and how to measure strength, but then also some different sources of institutional strength. And the last component was the societal component and the sources of enforcement and compliance that reside within society, in civil society in particular. We can talk about the example of pollution laws in Rosario, Argentina. This is a, a case where very extensive environmental legislation was on the books, had been for many decades, very ambitious legislation, but like legislation in much of Latin America, it was very weak and the rules were not complied with and obeyed by firms and in particular the large industries in the province that were polluting at a large scale and generating a lot of, of health consequences for the local population. And so when the state didn't act to enforce the laws on the books, local groups and concerned citizens and the people affected by the pollution took action and they began to mobilize and form different working groups and institutions of their own that could exert pressure on the federal government and so in particular local activists and city council members formed what they called a monitoring committee where they would simply monitor the pollution and the violations of the rules on the books. And in combination with provincial regulators who did take more of a concern, plant managers and local activists were capable of, of exerting enough influence to bring behavior in line with with rules and notice that the plant managers of the companies involved were even in, engaged to a certain extent. And this is one part of the story that's really interesting. You would think, well, wouldn't the firms involved in, in polluting have a, a unified interest in ignoring or disregarding those efforts and certainly not in participating in them? It's not always so seamless though in reality. And in some cases, firms plant managers leading these firms took an active role in cooperating with some local and provincial actors as part of an effort to bring about or enforce more compliance. And firms often need the support and the pressure of the state and official authorities. They need that pressure and, and that coercive capacity to really force them to, to make the right choices because though they might want to in spirit, they have a variety of, of motivations and different interests and different stakeholders within the firm can you know, easily steer the, the behavior of the firm in a way that is, is not compliant with those regulations. And so local activists in societal sources of compliant, compliance can be important when the rules on the books don't motivate the state or the firms themselves to, to cooperate and to comply with the rules on the books and to avoid polluting in this case. So that's gonna be the completion of our lecture on institutional strength. It was a long lecture, but I think that we learned a great deal. And more generally, it got us thinking about the, the fundamental questions related to political development and the emergence and evolution of political institutions and arrangements and the different political activities that people in society engage in. And 
the more general question for us is, what is the relationship or what is the role of democratization in political development? Why is it that we would think about democratization as a question of political development? How is it, why is it that democratization is a development issue? And before I return to that question, I just wanna show you a photo that I think is a useful gateway into this topic. Now, this is a photo from Belarus, which is uh, one of Hungary's last dictatorships, excuse me, um, one of Europe's last dictatorships. And it's a striking photo because it shows the contrast between the security forces representing the state and then the individual representing society. And as you know, political economy in one sense is the relationship between the individual and society or the relationship between the individual and the state. And so to think about political economy as relationships among individuals and actors, one of whom is the state, one of whom is the domain of individual actors, it's a useful way to think about democratization as well, because anytime we transition from authoritarian rule to democratic rule, we're engaged in a struggle in a conflict with the authoritarian elite, the dictatorship. No one gives up power easily, in many cases, not voluntarily. They at least have to be forced to do so. And so it is a confrontation, it is a struggle, it is a power struggle. And this struggle involves contention between individuals and the state, between civil society and the state. And so in the same way, that political economy is about the relationship between the individual and the whole, be it society or the state, so too is democratization about the conflict between civil society or individuals and the authoritarian elite or the authoritarian regime that, that must be brought to heal or surrender power for a, a democratic regime to emerge and, and consolidate. Now in Europe, the conflict between civil society and the authoritarian elite is not a frequent conflict. Most of Europe is democratic, but places like Hungary and Belarus do reckon with authoritarian regimes and relatively repressive and illiberal regimes. We'll talk more generally about democratization in patterns and trends and we'll talk about how societies and why societies transition from authoritarian rule to democratic rule. But in particular, we'll focus on the economic dimensions in the political economy of democratic transitions and the ways that the relationships between politics and economics bring about or support or inhibit transitions. We'll also talk about how individual level characteristics like inequality or the distribution of income or income levels can support or inhibit democratic transitions. But where I wanna begin with you today is in the broadest possible way by addressing or engaging with the question of why democratization is, is a development issue. Why are we talking about democratization in this class, you know, why not just deal with economic growth and improvements in education and literacy or infant mortality? Why are we now turning our attention to what appears to be a, a pretty straightforward question of political regime? Does anyone want to comment on why uh, democratization is a development issue? Max? I think the, the first thing is that it hinders um, development. You know, for instance, if you have like a corrupt leader who instead of spending money on education, maybe he's spending money on enforcing policing, um, things such as that. Yeah, so in a really straightforward sense, if the regime gives the leadership an incentive to use repressive tactics, use the police or the security forces to to um, uh, subordinate or repress the opposition, that is a, a use of resources that could be better spent on health or education or those more immediate 
development objectives that we think about. And it is true that authoritarian regimes, dictatorships do give leaders the incentive to basically siphon private benefits to their inner circle. They have an incentive to give benefits to this inner circle because those are the ones who support they rely on to stay in power. They don't need your vote. They don't need your support in the streets. In fact, in some sense, they can just continue to prop up the military and give more to the military. And the military will go into the streets and, and, and do the, the bidding of the dictatorship. So a, a dictatorship presents leaders with very different incentives than say a democratic regime where in theory, the leadership needs to be at least more responsive to more people in society and where at least theoretically, they would need to provide public benefits in order to maintain the support of a large enough constituency to remain in power. Now you might dispute you know, the functioning or the effectiveness of, of a democratic setup, but theoretically in, in, in sort of a comparison to a, a theoretical authoritarian regime, that's the way that the institutions should function. Those are the incentives that, that the democratic regime should present those leaders with, at least if the, the regime functions effectively. Now that's a separate question, but let's continue to address this beyond the, the question of the incentives for corrupt behavior or, or good governance. How else and in, in why else is democratization a development issue? Rady says the process of democratization is directly linked to economic development. Usually democracies tend to be more prosperous when compared to authoritarian regimes. So Rady, are you saying that economic development usually causes countries to transition to democracy? Not at all, it will be actually the other way around. Um, the, uh, the transition to democracy usually tends to create prosperity and um, economic development. So there certainly is the, the possibility that democratization could, could create new opportunities for growth. What we tend to see in the data is that one of the biggest drivers of democratization is economic development. So countries that do develop economically usually develop middle classes and they usually develop large relatively sophisticated citizens or groups of citizens who can exert pressure on the state and they come into tension with the authoritarian elite. And so often economic development comes before democratic transitions. Our perspective in the US, we seem to think about democracy often as this eternal thing. It's often the result of a process of modernization in many countries, but it is certainly true that democracy can also create new opportunities for economic growth and participation, especially if you associate things like property rights and ownership and access to credit and relative free participation in the economy, if you associate that with democracy, which generally speaking, we could because those are issues of, of rights and liberties. Max says South Korea is a different example where the dictatorship was actually quite beneficial to their development. That's actually true, it's exactly right. And the dictatorship through a technocratic elite was very capable and successful in kind of mobilizing and harnessing capital and making strategic decisions about investment. And then the timing of exposure to the international market and the subsequent development of comparative advantages and to their credit, the military elite in the dictatorship in South Korea did consciously and voluntarily turn over power to a democratically elected successor. And they did so at the, the, the pressure of a large civil society movement that was really led primarily by students. These students themselves were really indicative of, de of development because they were 
an illustration of increasing literacy and education rates, urbanization, the growth of, of the middle class, the expansion of, of, of access to all sorts of, of new and, and advanced technologies. South Korea developed relatively rapidly in, in the space of about 25 years, 35 years. And in a very straightforward way, development seemed to bring about democratization in that country. Victor says opposing views from parties at to the top tend to be slow at passing legislature. Uh, Victor, so can you relate that more closely to development? So, so far, the question that I have posed to you and that will anchor the rest of our discussion is, why is democratization a development issue? But we've also discussed so far some other parts of the, the conversation about how economic development and social development themselves can drive democratization. And this is an important question that we will discuss, but I'd also like us to be thinking about one more issue. And this is how democratization impacts institution building and strength. Remember that one of the key challenges in places like Latin America and in many developing democracies is weak institutions and rules that are not complied with and rules that forbid behaviors that are still engaged in. How do you strengthen institutions? Well, one perspective is through competitive elections and through competitiveness and democratic consolidation. Competitive elections and electoral competitiveness are supposed to drive institution building and strengthening because they give parties in power an incentive to create state institutions that are more responsive to the electorate who are voting in those highly contested races. So high levels of electoral contestation tend to coincide with institutional strengthening because it gives those parties who do in power a, a very powerful incentive to create better systems of governance and better institutions, and, and in particular, better public service delivery and, and better investments. All of this gives them very, very strong reasons to develop the state. And so this is why, one of the reasons why we expect electoral contestation and competitive elections to positively impact institution building and, and one of the reasons why moreover extreme party fragmentation and weak parties might also undermine institution building. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Let me first begin by highlighting what we know about democratization and about democracy and how we understand democracy to relate development to relate to development in a sort of big sense or in a general sense? Why is it that we associate democratization with development? Why is it a development issue? Well, it's a development issue because we know that people in democracies on balance tend to live wealthier, healthier, and more secure lives. I often will pose a question to students in my political economy classes, and I did for you too at the beginning of the semester. At some stage in the semester, I asked you, would you rather be a rich person in a poor developing country or would you rather be a <clears throat> middle class or relatively um, you know, modestly incomed person in a rich country? Students often choose rich in a poor country, but the correct answer is, well, it's better to be modest of modest means in a rich country because both A, you're likely to be better off even than the relatively rich person in the poor country, and then B, what many of you point out, you're probably more likely to have secure control of, of your income and your assets and your resources, you're enjoying civil rights and political liberties, and you're able to participate, and you're free from uh, avoidable death in a variety of ways because of your access to healthcare and so on and so forth, these kinds of things. So the point is in a democratic state, 
you're more likely to live a wealthier and healthier and, and more secure life. Even if democracy itself is not ideal, and even if it still does, you know, periodically generate bad outcomes, it still is on balance better in those ways. And so in that respect, democratization is a development issue. But there's also the question of rights and liberties like your property rights or your free participation in the economy. These matters also relate to development and we would think of them as issues of development as well. And certainly democracy better supports things like property rights than say an authoritarian or a dictatorship. Uh, for example, there is really no record of an agrarian or a, a, a kind of um, socialist democracy. Now, there are social democracies and there are the sort of leftist variants in Europe, but typically a democratic state supports property rights in, in broad ownership of, of economic and productive assets. And it's often difficult to make the two compatible um, state expropriation and ownership and, and democracy. And so as a consequence, democracies tend to be industrialized, developed societies, and, and often they do support the gains in wealth and income and health and in, in, in life expectancy that we do hope for from the perspective of development. Now, but on a political level, there are a lot of benefits as well. So first, in a democracy, at least theoretically, political elites report to citizens. They are accountable to voters and they've got to win and retain the support of a relatively broad, theoretically, constituency. That is a large group of, of voters acting in concert to exercise power and vote at the polls to, to make decisions about who will govern them. And so in this re regard, they've got an incentive to provide better public benefits. Uh, they've got an incentive to provide better public institutions and more responsive governance and to do so in a way that is freer from corruption than say a dictatorship where by definition the authoritarian leadership are responsive primarily to an inner circle because they rely on that inner circle alone for their political support and survival. It has everything to do with the incentives and the way that, that a democracy gives leaders an incentive to respond to the population or the constituencies at large that, that vote them into office, less corruption as a result. But there's also more, at least theoretically, there's more accountability between the branches of government themselves, the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. They are in effect, at least in a presidential system, co-equal branches of government. They survive independently and their election is, is something that takes place I will, perhaps simultaneously, but but it produces independent entities. And in this regard, they are co-equal. In a parliamentary regime, it can be a little bit different because the legislature and the executive, their survival is dependent, but still there are mechanisms built in that are supposed to ensure good governance and that are supposed to ensure accountability across different institutions. And these mechanisms of accountability, theoretically, are more or less absent in authoritarian regimes because with power concentrated in the hands of a narrow elite who rely on a narrow inner circle for their survival uh, and who are incentivized to siphon private benefits to that inner circle, uh, they're not accountable. And, and consequently, they don't necessarily face punishment or consequences for using repressive means or killing people on the streets who might oppose them. It's just fundamentally different. And people who live in dictatorships and under democracy at different points in their life will tell you this. If you interview them, uh, they will talk about how strikingly different those, those big differences are. And it makes us appreciate some of the, the limited benefits of, of the system that we have, even as we critique the, the shortcomings of the system. Fourthly, there's the simple fact that democracy by definition or theoretically is, is to empower citizens. You choose your leader. This is consistent with that focus on individual rights, individual freedom and choice and capability.
it has to do with the universe of possibilities available to you as an individual. That's what, in, that's what development is about. Uh, remember that that was the, the concept of, of development that Sen notoriously developed in that reading about development as freedom. In a literal sense, democracy enshrines that political freedom that is synonymous with development because you go to the polls and you choose the leadership you exercise civil and political rights and liberties that, that from the point of view of development are always inherent to the individual, but are unshackled, so to speak, under democracy, under the transition from authoritarian rule to democracy. And then finally, democracies have been shown to be less likely to fight one another. This is called the democratic peace, and it has to do with the apparent incentives that democratic institutions and relationships might create for state leaders and how those incentives might prevent conflict and might stop them from going to war. Now it's a highly controversial literature and many disagree with the, the theory as well as the evidence, but in a minimal sense, there is some support for the for the thesis that democracies are more peaceful because, because they have a, a different set of incentives and perhaps a different mindset that can uh, prevent them from, from going to war. Now this is in a general sense, how we, we can think about democratization as being consistent with development or how we think of it as one dimension of development. But at this stage, you should be asking, well, what is democratization and how can we think about this as a, a set of processes or as a, as a historical moment in a trajectory that a country might be on in development? And the definition that we'll use is the most prominent one from the very large literature that has emerged in this, this area of comparative politics. And it is the following. A democratic transition is the interval between one political regime and another, delimited on the one side by the launching of the process of dissolution of an authoritarian regime, and on the other by the installation of some form of democracy. And transitions begin when dictators declare their intention to give up power and hand it over to democratically elected successors, and they end when they actually do. So the transition is really that moment in time between the declaration of intent to leave power and the handover of power to the democratically elected successor. And that successor must be freely and fairly elected. Democratic transitions consequently can take, they can take the space of a, of a couple of weeks, a day, they can take years, decades, and they have, and there's significant variation in how long they last or, or take based upon the different types of democratic transitions that we've conceptualized and conceived of. For our purposes, we'll just think about transitions as a single category. We won't differentiate between different types because it won't be that useful for us in our economic and political economy analysis, but we will be thinking of transitions nevertheless in this kind of historical sense where we're thinking about the interval or the moment that separates the, the, the sort of beginning of the end of a dictatorship and then the formal beginning of a democratic regime as indicated by the, the taking over of, of power by a democratically elected government. And so the period that we most associate with transitions in the generated the most lively debate in the literature was really between 74 and 1999. And this is the period that coincided with the most active involvement of the international development community in domestic policy, regime transitions, economic transitions. In a lot of ways, the international development community in the democratic consolidation and democratic transitions sort of community overlapped and became one because the Washington consensus, for example, almost always at least tacitly promoted democratic reforms and argued that neoliberal reforms were best accompanied by democratic reforms that permitted full participation in politics, property rights, um, and a, a robust uh, 
judiciary and independent institutions that could ensure checks on power, accountability, and, and rule of law, and rights and liberties. And so in a lot of ways, democratization became intertwined with economic development and international development. And groups like the World Bank and the IMF became more and more interested in democratization and, and, and democratic reforms. And so these democratic transitions will understand in that way. But the most recent wave of democratic transitions is the wave that we'll actually pay a little bit more attention to in this class because the Arab Spring, the wave of upheaval and revolution that gripped the Middle East beginning in the early 2010s did give way to a couple new democracies. And the only one that's really survived is Tunisia. Egypt was also a new one for a brief period, but that story, the update is unfortunate because military rule is once again, the regime type in, in Egypt, but Tunisia is a new democracy. And so we can learn a great deal from Tunisia. And my objective for today is to demonstrate and illustrate what a democratic transition looks like and the role of individuals in civil society We'll also take a look at some of the obstacles to deeper democratic reform and economic development in Tunisia. So the objective here is to get a sense and explore what a society in transition looks like. This is a transition that is both political as well as economic and social. And you'll see elements of all of those components in this footage. And I want you to be thinking about what we can learn from Tunisia as a society in transition and as a place where various obstacles to deeper democratic reform and development might, might still be in place despite the success of the early 2010s. Almost three months after the revolution that ended the 23-year reign of Tunisia's aging autocrat, Zini El Abdin Ben Ali, the atmosphere on the streets of Tunis is one of anxious calm mixed with anticipation. Evidence of the revolution is everywhere. Slogans are scrawled across banners and walls, and red and white Tunisian flags flutter in the early spring sunshine. The police, who played a central and often brutal role under the former regime, are barely visible. In their absence, soldiers, the temporary custodians of public order until a new government is formed, loiter behind barbed wire that's tangled around any meeting place or monument where trouble might or did erupt. For the most part, their presence is barely noted as passers-by head to work or to meet friends in the city's cafes. La rue n'est pas la même que uh, la première période de, de la pré-révolution tunisienne. Sabi Kalfoui is a student activist who spent time in jail during the revolution. C'est beaucoup plus calme. On continue toujours à parler de la politique, à, à attendre les élections. C'est le, le retour à la normale, quoi. Now that the barricades have come down and life is returning to normal, assorted revolutionaries, government officials, and hopeful office seekers have begun the business of building a new democracy. Since Mr. Ben Ali fled on January 14th, Tunisia has had three interim governments. The first two were short-lived. Many former members of his Constitutional Democratic Rally, the RCD, played starring roles, prompting further protests and violence. La contre-révolution, elle est certainement là. On ne peut pas imaginer qu'un qu parti politique qui a gouverné la Tunisie pendant 55 ans lâchera prise euh, facilement. Aller directement aux élections pour concrétiser la valeur démocratique et le côté démocratique de la révolution. Any vestiges of the RCD will have to contend with some 70 odd parties expected to register ahead of the July Constituent Assembly election. Communists, socialists, unionists, greens, human rights activists, Islamists are all clamoring to be heard. A likely front runner in a new government is the Liberal Democratic Progressive Party. Maya Shribi is its Secretary General. Nous sommes en phase de compétition et le citoyen tunisien a besoin de connaître les partis un à un. Euh, après un certain moment, je suis sûre qu'il y a des partis qui vont fusionner et qu'il y a d'autres partis qui vont peut-être rester petits. 
Another party that could benefit from this fragmented landscape is Nahda, Tunisia's main Islamist party, which was banned under Mr. Ben Ali. Party leaders say they want a democratic state in which women will play a full role, but there are fears that Nahda contains some extremist elements. Secularists find their participation in a democracy problematic. Ajmi Lurimi is a senior member of the party who spent 17 years in jail. But there are fears that Nahda contains some extremist elements and that after almost two decades in exile or in jail, the more moderate members of the party are out of touch with contemporary Tunisia. With its tree-lined boulevards and political slogans drawn from Enlightenment thinkers, Tunis seems a cosmopolitan back. So this is a video from 2011, and it, it may be 2012 or 2013, pardon me, but it's a society in transition, and it's a moment in the midst of that transition, that interval between Ben Ali announcing his intent and then leaving power, and then eventually a democratic government taking power. Now the interim governments that took power in between were many and were numerous, and those wouldn't be considered democratic governments because they weren't elected governments. But the transition in Tunisia was a bumpy one because so many different political groups emerged during the, trans the transition and fought for seats in the early elections. And there's significant evidence that some of the democratic disillusionment in Tunisia is most significant among groups that expected their victories to be the, the most pronounced, but ultimately were the most uh, unsuccessful in the eventual elections. The moment that's interesting for us is now the, the current in the last few years in particular, where we find Tunisia still grappling with many of those early questions about what kind of a trajectory the country would set off on and what steps would be taken. Unfortunately, in, in many ways, steps haven't been taken. No serious economic reforms have been, have been advanced. The power and the strength of the employers associations as well as the unions and the workers have prevented the governments from taking a firm step in any given direction and slow growth and slow progress along a lot of social fronts has meant that people are very disillusioned with, with democracy. And they, they frankly are increasingly concerned that it may not have kept its promise. And this is a moment where we can pause and once again, examine a society in transition and one where many of the challenges of development are still being identified and reckoned with and, and, and solved. Some of the interesting ironies include the strength of the civil society movements helping to bring about democratization on the one hand, but then also preventing many of the essential economic reforms that could deepen and promote development on the other hand. It's also interesting to know that, that in, in Tunisia, the military and the security forces have actually been sort of a problem in the sense that underinvestment and the weakness of the military and the security forces have required a substantial focus on those areas at precisely the moment when social and economic objectives need to be, need to be identified and, and, and reached first and foremost in order to build up those constituencies necessary to support democratic and economic development. So there's a lot here, and I want you to notice the complexity of all of it as we turn our attention to the update. Now, this is from just a couple years ago, but it gives you a good sense of where Tunisia came from as far as the transition was concerned, and then where they are now in terms of deepening and, and consolidating democracy.
It was an act of despair that sparked the Arab Spring. On December 17th, 2010, street vendor Mohammed Bouazizi lit himself on fire in front of a government building in the Tunisian town of Sidi Bouzid. He was protesting against the confiscation of his vegetable cart and the police brutality that he had been subjected to. Bouazizi died two weeks after his self-immolation, but his actions sparked protests across the country and the region. Many Tunisians shared Bouazizi's anger and desperation. Then President Zain al-Abidin Ben Ali tried to quell the mass protests, promising to end police crackdowns and initiate legislative elections within six months. But protesters were adamant. On January 4, 2011, Ben Ali fled the country and took refuge in Saudi Arabia, putting an end to his 23 years of rule. Eight years later, Tunisia has been dubbed a success story of the region, but some Tunisians remain doubtful. The country is still facing waves of protests and strikes, demanding jobs and higher wages. And some of the protesters compared Tunisia's current ruling parties with the former regime's corrupt family. Despite making political progress, such as putting a new constitution in place and holding four elections since 2011, the nine cabinets that held office after the revolution have failed to find solutions to high unemployment and rising inflation rates. Last month, more than half a million public sector workers went on strike across Tunisia over the government's refusal to raise wages. Tunisia's economy is struggling with a big budget deficit. Protesters accuse the government of failing to keep its promises of providing jobs and tackling corruption, and reforms suggested by the IMF were not welcomed in the streets. The economic crisis has translated into growing distrust of politicians. A 2018 poll suggested that two-thirds of Tunisian youth don't trust any political party. This became obvious in the 2018 local elections, which witnessed the lowest voter turnout since 2011. Despite the economic crisis, the country has managed to maintain one of the most important gains of its revolution, the freedom of press and assembly. But without economic recovery, the country still has a long way to go. And so as you can see, there's an intimate relationship between the political situation and the economic situation. And in many ways, the struggle to reconcile the economic situation has held the country back on the political front as they still seek political stability, they still seek trust in democratic governments, they still seek satisfaction among in particular young voters and most of whom are unemployed and in need of work and left wanting by the, the new regime. They're not necessarily supportive of authoritarian rule, it's just that democratic governments and democratic politics haven't been a refuge for them, haven't markedly improved their situation. And I'd like to ask you, as we begin to step back and address some of the questions that, that come up in this footage, you know, based on what you see, has democratization kept its promise in Tunisia? And why or why not? Alternatively, uh, what are the obstacles to democratic development? I think in general, based on the videos, I'd like to know if you see democratization as keeping some of those, those development promises that we talked about. 
Sorry, I had to answer a phone call, but um, you know, based off the videos with Tunisia, it looks like almost the, the promises were not kept with democratization, uh, you know, akin to the, the protests that were still continuing by the citizens. They're still upset that there hadn't been the results achieved that they were hoping for in terms of democracy. So what were they expecting from democracy? Uh, I think they're hoping for a fair election or even an election in general um, in order to change the current regime. Well, they've had many elections. They've had many, many elections. Since 2011, they've had so many elections that, that um, they're a little tired of elections. But what are they expecting from some of those governments that have been in place periodically since 2011? What kinds of economic outcomes are they hoping for based on what we saw? I think they're looking for an open economy, something that promotes entrepreneurialism uh, and allows for the freedom of each individual uh, to do what they want, maybe pull out credit loans uh, and or ask the government for help in terms of policy. So as Rady points out, citizens were still protesting for higher wages, more jobs in the end of police brutality. So the peaceful assembly, the right to protest, these were things that seemed to be well established and well enshrined. I think that the police brutality has mostly been brought to an end, but they are demanding more jobs, higher wages, all of the things that they've been unable to have so far primarily because the government has been unable to advance a reform bill, mainly due to the opposition of both unions and employers. And so what's interesting is many of the protesters and the opponents of these democratic governments demands uh, are things that these democratic governments have been un unable to, to push through precisely because of the opposition of those, those groups. And so what's interesting about Tunisia is that democratic development often has a lot to do with the growth of, of the middle class, the organization of civil society, the exercise of civil and political rights and liberties. And in every way you see that exhibited in, in Tunisia, but some of the same benefits of civil society have held the country back and prevented economic reforms that would be necessary to, to promote economic growth and resolve some of the challenges to, to democratic development since 2011. And so there is a close link between economics and politics here. And they also expected governments to address the corruption within the system, as Karina points out in the chat as well. And so that's certainly part of it too. Rady says, so even with a different government, they are still suffering many of the big factors that led to the social movement press protest in the first place. Well, one of the big, well, to be clear, they were objecting to dictatorship and police brutality and repression during the Arab Spring. And of course, economic concerns were part of it, but they had more fundamental concerns at that point. Since the transition and the successful transition to at least democratic elections, they've begun to focus more on corruption and economic concerns that, that are more targeted to the specific issues under the democratic governments. And so they have changed their objective, but they always did concern themselves to a certain degree with employment because in the Middle Eastern countries, youth unemployment is particularly high um, for reasons that we can get into on Wednesday. But this is our introduction to everyone to democratization. We will talk more about the political economy of, of democratic transitions. We'll talk about everything from the political economic origin of democratic institutions, both in history and contemporarily and analytically. And we'll talk about some different perspectives on democratization as well. So all of that and more awaits us on Wednesday and Friday. Very good to see you. Welcome back. See you on Wednesday. Sweet, thank you. I was wondering if I could ask you a question about Myanmar.